All right, good day everyone, and welcome to something we haven't done for a while, which is a nation analysis for Dominions 5. I love doing nation analyses, but um, I try and limit myself to nations that I've either played against significantly, observed, or played myself, because um, I don't like pure theory crafting. I like a little bit of experience before I do so. And I'm finally at the point now where I feel confident doing at least a basic guide for one of the more interesting, in terms of fluff terms, nations in the Dominions universe, and that is the Nation of the Pale Ones, Agatha in the Early Age. A little bit of fluff before we get into this one because it's kind of interesting. The pale ones uh, are, as a species, are one that you divide between feeling sorry for and feeling like they got what they what they put themselves in for. They are a race of long-lived, relatively slow and ungainly, pale-skinned, rock-consuming, subterranean, cyclopean giants. Um, that range from the ordinary age size threes up to the ancient size fours, and their compatriot species, the um, the troglodytes and the olms, who share the underground environment with them. The story of the um, Agarthans in Dominions is that they're actually they seem to be quite an old race. A, a previous Pentocrator in an age before the early age, long before the early age, in fact, created the mother of the Agarthan species through basically earth magic essentially in the in the wombs of the earth and one of the pretender options is that character however that sort of progenitor of the pale ones would later on show some uh show some spunk and be a bit you know iffy around the pentocrator and get herself in trouble because she foresaw what the pentocrator would do which was sacrifice a large number of pale ones who are at that point a extremely low-tech, almost completely innocent race, sacrifice many, many hundreds and thousands of them in order to create a seal behind which uh, a number of the defeated gods of the Pantheon at the time, who the Pantocrator defeated, were locked. So it wasn't like pretenders who were sent to Tartarus. He actually defeated other gods that were in the active pantheon, locked them in god vessels, and sealed them behind a seal in Agatha by sacrificing many, many Agathan lives to create um, the seal that holds them in place. And that explains why Agatha actually has this site, the Chamber of the Seal, behind which those god vessels sit. So the Agathans, the Pale Ones, have been underground or occasionally amphibious in their caves for a long period of time. And as times come into the early age, you get the impression that they have a relatively, um, that they had a moderately benign society. But agitators begin to act, and as you see through the story of one or two of their heroes, a couple of things happen. Firstly, the Agarthans get tempted into potentially breaking the seal that they have been guarding for so long, which is something that you yourself can choose to do, playing EA Agartha. And also, they choose to invade the surface world in Fluff. The problem with invading the surface world, when you are a bunch of cave-dwelling Cyclopean giants who aren't particularly quick-witted or agile, is that they have no conception of what warfare on the surface is like. They are continuously outmaneuvered, outflanked, picked apart and destroyed by the humans and the other races of the land they choose to invade. That, coupled with other disasters, leads to what you see in middle-aged Agatha, where the Pale One species is decimated and holding on. In the early age, you're in the period before the invasion. There are no humans in the caves of Agatha, just Olms and Agathan Pale Ones themselves. And as such, you have an opportunity playing as early age Agatha to change the course of their history, to repeat the invasion of the overworld, but this time actually make it stick and make it work. So that's a little bit of fluff. They're an interesting species, they're an interesting race. They're at one side innocent and beaten down by previous Pantocrators, but they're also destroyed by their own temptations and hubris, trying to invade the surface world that they know nothing about and are not well matched against, considering breaking the seal, which they obviously shouldn't do. It's a terrible idea. They have that complexity of being both pitiable, but also in the end, ultimately doomed by their own choices. At least that's my take on the fluff. Let's get into the nation itself. Top level characteristics before we get into that. The Agatha is a earth using semi-giant and giant nation. They are slow plotting masters of siege, attritional warfare, and importantly, they are a summons based nation. They are all about bringing unique national summons to the fight and about using earth magic and a couple of key cross paths in order to grind down their opponents with 
big buffs that make their otherwise sort of mediocre troop offerings viable. Let's go through the troop and mage lineups because I think it'll answer a lot of questions about what the basic characteristics of the Agarthans are. Then we'll make some strategic observations having made having gone through those units and mages. So let's go, let's go first things first. And the Pale One Militia is useful because it demonstrates the characteristics of an Agarthan, of an Agarthan Pale One in just the clearest sense possible. A Pale One Militia costs six gold which is extremely cheap. Six gold, two resources, 12 recruitment points. This thing is cheaper than most human troops. It has 18 hit points, almost twice as many as most human troops. Size three, because it normal Pale One Agarthans are size three, has basically, this one has no protection, above average magic resistance. It's a militia, so it has eight morale. And then because it's an Agarthan, it has above average strength and terrible skills. Woeful skills, attack skill 7, defense skill 7, precision 7, combat speed 10. This is a bad, com in combat terms, unit. It has map move 8, which is another Agarthan sort of um, byline. They're slow. The Agarthan army ain't getting anywhere quickly. You are going to your target one province at a time, and that's how fast you're moving. Getting your armies to move fast and that, we'll talk about some options, but there's not many. There's a couple of other characteristics of Pale Ones that are worth noting at this point. They're all amphibious. You can technically take all of your Pale One troops underwater. And considering almost all your units use bronze equipment, you are capable of doing so. Agartha is a truly amphibious nation. We'll talk about why they probably can't take on the underwater nations, but they can make a game of it under certain circumstances, in part because all their units are indeed amphibious. They don't need to eat. This is important. So Pale Ones digest rocks, just, just rocks. They process, they extract minerals. I'm not sure exactly how their biology is meant to work. Earth magic must run in their veins, but it, it apparently it works. Um, and it might go some of the way towards explaining why they're a bit, you know, slow and under energetic given despite their size. But not needing to eat is a huge advantage for Agarthans. It gives them the ability to take their big armies of high-sized units into low supply provinces. It frees them of the need to do supply items. It allows them to stack siege defense to obscene levels if they want to, because they're not limited by the supply limits of their own province, only how much gold and units they're willing to devote to the cause. So not needing to eat is actually a bigger deal than you'd think. Probably more of a deal when there are lots of pop kill nations around, which is more a case in later ages than in the early age. Theridos is really your only cause of this in the early age. But nonetheless, it does mean that Therodian, Therodian destroyed lands, not an obstacle for pale ones. Because they don't need to eat anything, there's no supply problems, they can move on and crack the forts. And crack the forts they can with built-in siege bonuses on almost all the units that range from moderate to obscene. For six gold, you get 3.4 siege strength on a pale one militiaman. That is very good value, very good value. And most Pale Ones have very good value when it comes to Siege. Dark Vision, 100%. This is, again, pretty universal on the Pale One Agarthans. So, caves, darkness, um, deep oceans, um, places that are affected under spells, a, a world under utter dark, all of that is good news for Pale Ones because they can see perfectly in the dark. And you've probably already twigged that if you have terrible attack and defense skills but perfect dark vision, then darkness has a potential to be a big equalizer for this nation if your opponent can't see in the dark because a six-point swing in skills is often enough to make these guys actually competent. And the final thing is cold-blooded. Cold-blooded means that when you're in cold environments, you gain extra encumbrance, so you gain fatigue quicker. Um, this can get extreme and very in certain circumstances, to the point where in cold three provinces, if your opponent then doubles up and throws like Grip of Winter, your units are falling asleep at the drop of a hat. Meanwhile, in Heat 3, Cold-Blooded doesn't actually hurt you that much. What this means is that Pale Ones are basically the polar opposite of, say, Neefles. This is a nation that needs to fight in heat scales, because if it walks into it, neutral scales are okay. In that respect, they're different from Late Age Atlantis or Niflheim. Cold Blooded doesn't punish you until you get into cold scales. So you can go neutral heat one, two, three. Once you're in cold one, two, three, you start running into trouble quickly. 
very important to keep in mind. And again, it encourages slow plotting fighting in which you're operating primarily within scales that are friendly to you, or maybe even seasonally at times that agree with you. Having introduced the concept of the Pale One, let's zip through the units and see how it progresses. Pale One Warriors, recruitable anywhere. Again, we're looking at a unit that is cheaper than a human, has almost twice as many hit points, now we're up to 13 protection. It's still horrifically slow, we have average morale, we still have our siege bonus, but our skills are still militia level. So what are you getting here? You're paying more resources to get decent protection on a decent sack of hit points. You've got a bronze spear, but your skills are still woeful. Going over to the Pale One Warrior. Both of these are recruitable in Ks, by the way. This one, what's happening is you're saving some resources. So 19 resources is becoming 11. And in exchange, you're losing your hat. I think that's dumb. I would generally keep the hat. In fact, hatless nations in Dominions usually get laughed at for this reason. Ur is criticised greatly because they haven't invented the hat in the early age, apparently. Lack of hats is a problem. Buy hats. Ordinary Pale Ones. So this is a slight step up from your Pale One Militia. The difference between this and the Militia is, is marginal. Marginal at best. Like, slightly more skills in exchange for paying tw um, an extra two gold per... I, much of a muchness, absolutely much of a muchness. That said, with those differences in costs, in percentage terms, it's a pretty big saving if you're willing to go down to the militia. And the extra defense skill is just a buckler anyway, so maybe stick with the militia. Wet ones can be recruited in caves. What makes wet ones different? Uh, they're worse. So the idea with the wet ones, wet ones are the Agathans who live primarily in the water as opposed to pale ones who live primarily in caves, wet ones live primarily in the water. You can recruit them uh, underwater, in underwater forts, in their already swimming, swimming animation. This guy becomes the swimming animation when he goes underwater. The difference with wet ones is they use stone equipment and shark skin armor rather than bronze, but considering bronze doesn't rust underwater because it ain't iron, you're better off not using the wet version anyway, so don't recruit wet ones. There is a militia, uh, not militia, mercenary unit, that's made up entirely of wet ones. They're pretty crap, but I've seen them used. Cavern Guard. Cavern Guard are the elite, believe it or not, the elite of the Agathan army in the early age. These guys cost 12 gold, as much as a slightly above average human. 23 resources, 24 recruitment points. So it's priced as a slightly above average human infantryman. You get 21 hit points. Big sack of HP. You go up to 13 prot, and the early age 13 prot is respectable. 12 MR, 12 magic resistance, attack skill 9, defense skill 9, map move 8. These guys are still, you know, they're, they're heavily armed. They're reasonably armored. If you look at that glaive that they have, 25 damage, mixture of slashing and piercing, and both of those are good options. It does mean underwater half the time they're going to take an attack penalty, which they can't afford because half the time they'll be slashing. But on land, slashing damage gets bonus on what's left after protection, and, pen and um, piercing reduces protection. So either way, against high armored units, the Cavern Guard are still probably going to butcher them if they can hit, and hitting is this unit's problem. It would be a great unit if its attack and defense were just a bit better. <laughs> problem is they're not. It does have a small bonus, castle defense 1, so you get 1.3 siege defense and 3.7 siege strength. Respectable unit on attack and defense for siege purposes, noting of course that it still doesn't need to eat. Cavern Guard, usable blockers, but they get hit a lot. They get hit a lot, and by things that can if they get hit a lot by things that can go through their prot, they're going to die. And that's the, that's the summary of most pale ones. They only get two to a square, and if they get hit lots, eventually that big sack of HP effect is going to go, and they're going to die. And if they hit things, they'll hurt it, particularly the cavern guards who do lots and lots of damage. However, they're unlikely to hit things because their stats kind of suck. Now, if pale ones survive, despite their complete lack of combat skills, eventually they grow into ancient ones. Ancient Ones are interesting, and notably, all of the Ancient Ones are sacred, and they are not capital only. Seal Guard are capital only, the other ones are not. So, Agatha is technically a nation with recruit any fort sacreds. Interesting to keep in mind. Ancient Ones, 
cost 40 gold, so as much as four humans. They are size four, so you only get one per square. Size four is arguably the worst size in the game to be. You are still only one per square, but you have none of the benefits of being size five or size six. Size threes at least get two per square. Size fours do not. So what else have we got going for us? Well, for four times human gold, and not more, not four times human resources and rec points, we get four times human hit points. We cover as much territory as three humans. We have only 12 protection, presumably because we have big un unarmored legs and arms and things like that. We have a little more magic resistance. We have a little more morale. Um, we have a decent amount of strength, and we still have horrifically bad combat skills. Attack skill 9, defense 10, and we only do 21 damage with our spear, so which is less than the glaive of the cavern guards. So we've actually lost a little bit of combat ability and damage there in exchange for being sacred. Sacred and big and fat, and because we are big and fat, we have lots and lots of seed strength, but it'd still be cheaper to buy lots of militia instead. Is the Ancient One an intimidating sacred? No. No, it is not. It is not because that attack and defense skill is horrible and needs fixing or complementing if it's going to do any job well to be worth its price. That said, it's a recruit anywhere sacred, so there's shenanigans you can possibly do. And they're map move 12 rather than map move 8 because they have longer, more developed, multi-century old legs. Ancient stone hurlers come in two versions. One has armor, one doesn't. The naked ancient stone hurler lets it all hang out and has his fists and a boulder. You still pay 40 gold, you only pay one resource, you pay more resources for the other version. We're primarily gonna look at the armored version as this is the one most people would consider because 11 resources is not gonna be a limiter for the 40 gold and 32 rec points will. So you have a fist attack where you just punch people with attack skill seven and you have a boulder. Boulder is an interesting weapon. You have five ammunition. Range is only str is strength divided by three. So, you know, around seven, around seven range. The, dip, the interesting thing here is because your range is so low, the effect of precision is diminished. So you might hit things anyway. Ancient stone hurlers have a couple of points going for them. Well, for one, I wouldn't give them a massive archer bless, but it would be hilarious. With these, these things with lots of precision could be funny. I don't think it's good, but it'd be really funny. They have two purposes. The first is this thing has 14 siege strength. 14, because it's got siege bonus 10. They throw the rocks and they knock down parts of the wall. So this is one of the most cost-effective siege units out there just hands down. It's got half upkeep because it's sacred. It only costs 40 gold and it has the siege strength of 14 humans. Not bad. The other thing they can do, which is hilarious, is I have seen these used carefully, very well scripted in certain setups to kill elves. To kill elves or mega blessed cav or things like that because ranged weapons don't care about glamour and 28 damage sure as heck don't care about your protection buff. So a couple of ancient stone hurlers who throw their rocks at last moment and a nice big group of elves that are packed up in their glamour with whatever hell bless they've got going on um, will snot one with every boulder that hits pretty much. It's, it's pretty funny. Is it easy to do? No. Is it reliable? It didn't seem reliable when I saw it, like the scripting is pretty finicky, the rocks are unreliable, but I've seen it done, and when it works, it's a thing of absolute freaking beauty that this guy, these big dumb giants, can snot these multi-century old skilled savant elves. It's, it's kind of funny. Everyone in Dominions laughs when an elf gets hit with a boulder in the face and dies. The Seal Guard are the capital-only version, and the Seal Guard are the absolute elite. They're the best of the best. Trained for decades. They're equipped with sacred weapons, the Obsidian Glaze, which we'll talk about in a moment. And the result of all of those skills is attack skill 10, defense skill 10, which is average. So for 45 gold, 37 resources, 39 recruitment points, you get a 44 hit point sack of HP. You go up to 14 protection. You have six encumbrance now. You got more magic resistance. You got more morale. And you have a glaive that hits at attack skill 11 for 34 magical damage. These things hit like garms. They hit like garm herdings with a built-in magical weapon. The obsidian glaive, which is built using the obsidian they find around the chamber that contains the imprisoned gods, 
is a formidable weapon. If it was held by a troop that was more skilled, this thing would be really dangerous because it hits so bloody hard. As it is, one troop per square, low defense, rapidly going to be harassed, probably going to get cut down. Not the greatest sacred in the world, but not super expensive for a giant either with lots of hit points and classic pale one advantages. That's your pale one land lineup. Uh, honorable mention, and when I say honorable, I should mean dishonorable mention to your underwater recruits, the wet ones. Your shark skin wet one has a stone spear instead of bronze and wears um, shark skin armor, which is inferior to bronze armor. The ancient wet one is a sacred unit wearing shark skin, who I believe is pretty much like outright inferior in just about every way to his land cousin. In fact, I think he is just outright, except for the fact that there's a resource cost difference. Yes, you can save a bunch of resources and recruit even more sacreds if you want to get the ancient wet ones from the water. And now because of the early age, there are two auxiliary species that the Agarthans use in their troop lineup. One is the Trog, one's the Great Olm. Troglodytes recruit anywhere. It's a 50 gold size for Protection 7 Trampler. Um, I've seen people use them. We've all been attacked by them when they're indies. I don't like them. They're high morale, which makes them better than a lot of tramplers, and there's a leader that's specifically designed to lead them. I just think Agatha can do better things than spend 50 gold per in order to expand with size 4 tramplers. The Great Olm is the other option for how you make expansion work. The Great Olm is a 50 gold mind blaster, and it's one of the better mind blasters in the game. It has more hit points than most other mind blasters at 28, costs the same as, for example, Relay's land ones, the Andreleths, has good MR, uh, good morale, and because it's sacred, it actually halves its upkeep. This is an expensive unit, but being sacred helps it a little bit. The fact that it only costs one resource also helps. This is a um, capital and cave only troop, which is why Agatha covets caves like you wouldn't believe. You're going to fort your cave so you can make more Olms. And the Olm is what makes the Agathan army in the early game work at all. Because even if the dumb Pale One has like is slow and dim-witted and not particularly agile and you know didn't really pass hand-eye coordination in school, if the Great Olm manages to paralyze the enemy by like mind blasting it so that it's twitching on the ground rather than fighting back. Even the Pale Ones can find a way to stick it with the spear and kill it. So your early game army ends up looking like a mixture of very hard-hitting Pale Ones, so probably things like Cavern Guard and Seal Guard and maybe Ancient Ones, the guys that, guys that generally do lots of damage and have moderate at best skills, supported by Olms who paralyze the enemy and let your big dumb giant stab them. That's the synergy, and it's why Agatha owes a lot to these guys, the, the Great Olms. It's also why losing um, Olms in the early game is a great loss for EA Agatha. So there's our troop lineup. We've got lots of HP sacks. We've got lots of siege strength. We have good logistics in the sense that we don't need to eat, but we're very slow moving. We have recruit anywhere sacreds, but they're not particularly good. We have shitty underwater recruits. And then we have mind blasters that make all of our like mediocre troops viable by mind blasting our opponents. It just means our army is very gold intensive because mind blasters are incredibly gold intensive in general. Let's have a look at the supporting mage lineup. Pale One Scout, it's 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 a Pale One Scout. It's an amphibious national scout. That that's all you really care about. Um, the Pale One Commander who is also cave recruit, so you don't need forts to recruit more of these if you want them, they're basic leadership dudes. They're just 35 gold, 60 liters. They're not particularly great. The troglodyte lord, um, like, if you want to thug him, maybe? Like, if you want to thug out a size 4 trampler? I don't know. Otherwise, this thing's got, like, no leadership. Um, no purpose. I wouldn't make them. I haven't seen them used. People can chime in if they found a purpose. But... Uh, the, the only reason I can think is if there's some sort of thug build for this thing that would work that is better than using a mage instead. I don't know. Ancient Lords, Sacred, Inspirational 1, and uh, Leadership 80 means that this is a moderately good leader. You can put things in formations. They will get morale bonuses. Downside, it's 125 gold for a non-magical leader. 
it, it's you, you need one per big army just to put things in lines and formations, etc. It also has no magic or undead leadership, which is a problem, but you'll be bringing mages to support you. They can lead them instead. Now let's get into the, the interesting stuff. This is the These two are the non-capital recruit mages. You look like you've got a lot of mages, but all of this is cap only. Well, this is cap only, and this is cap and caves. The engraver is option number one. The engraver is one of the most cost-effective researchers in the game. You pay 70 gold, you get nine research points, and the unit is sacred, which halves the upkeep. So, 28 gold per year for nine research. Especially in magic scales, that's a very good deal. They're E1. E1's not a fantastic combat path. So these are not great emergency mages. They don't have great, they don't have any leadership. They don't have any combat skills. And E1 is not fantastic so far as combat paths go. So they're not great, oh shit, empty your lab mages. But if you're going to a turn and you need to get a little bit extra money because you've got infrastructure you want to build, you've got a mage you want to get out elsewhere, you've got armies that you want to build, and you just need to find some gold somewhere but you don't want to fall behind, building engravers instead of earth readers for a turn in your other forts will still keep your research going, it will not cost you much in the long run, and it will save you gold on that turn. The engraver is a useful thing to have. However, you can understand why people, if they have lots of gold, would rather be recruiting earth readers. The earth reader is a less efficient researcher, let's just be very clear about that. You're paying more than twice as much for like 20% more research. And in magic scales, the advantage in percentage terms gets even less. It is still sacred, yes, so you still have the halve upkeep on both of them. The difference is, the, um, I'm just making sure the differences were all there. The differences are, firstly, E2 with a random, fire, water, or death plus E2. And E2 is an acceptable combat path. E2, you can do stuff. E2, you can earth power, so you're practically an E3. E3 with a random. So in the event you have to go to war, Earth Readers are acceptable combat mages. They can do a lot of Earth magic. An, e, an Earth Reader with Earth Boots is Earth 4 for the purpose of most combats. And that's quite high. So if your labs include a couple of Earth Readers, that lab is always ready to put out mages to support offensive or defensive operations. And because Agatha is so slow to move around, having mages staged around your empire ready to support or defend is important. So a mixture of recruitment between the engraver and earth reader is the way most people are probably going to go depending on where their finances are at. More engravers when they're poor, more earth readers when they've got money to spend. The Olm Sage, uh, I had 175 gold for Water 2 E1 without a random, is a little bit dear. One thing to note is if you decide you have to fight underwater, and you've got a couple of caves, so you can recruit them outside your capital, Water 2 is enough with water power to make water elementals underwater, and Agatha almost always researches conjuration, so you're almost always going to have Conj 5 if you have to fight underwater. So if you need to go to war underwater, Olm Sages, if you have them, are your water elemental and water magic casters. They're useful to have in that context. Outside that context, a little bit of water is fine to add to your environment, but they're basically a very expensive mind blaster at that point, and you can probably do better, especially if you're recruiting them out of your capital. Oh, one thing I didn't mention, like Earth Readers, they are Fortune Tellers 10, so they have a percentage chance to prevent bad events that would otherwise afflict the province that they are in, and only the province they are in. But it does mean they're probably protecting your forts and your capital. And now it's the big guys. The big guys of the big guys, the capital-only mages. So, Agatha is ruled by oracles and a closed council. The closed council is the most senior oracles who are presented as heroes in the game, and we'll go through those later. But you can recruit three types of oracle, so big Agathan dumb mages, in your capital. The first is subterranean waters, commonly known as the most underwhelming uh, and least recruited of the oracles. So it gives you water one, earth three, and a random one chance at either water or earth, and then a 10% chance again. So you're either going to be water two, earth three, holy three, or you're going to be water one, earth four, holy three. Of those, most people would say the earth four is better. And if you wanted water magic, you're probably recruiting the Olms instead, instead of making a 4 rec point 355 gold mage. Like, 
there are not many people who will make uh, oracles of subterranean water. There are niche purposes, which we may or may not discuss, but they're not super common. The Oracle of Subterranean Fires, Fire 1, Earth 3, Holy 3, random again, you'll see the theme, Fire and Earth. So again, you can get that big uh, Earth path, but you can also go up to Fire 2, there's a very, very small chance that you'll get a Fire 3, but really don't build any of your builds around the assumption that you will get one. The odds are against you. So, this is a unit that can cast a number of national spells, and is otherwise useful, and like all the oracles, is a big earthcaster. Probably the most common is the Oracle of the Dead, because this brings a little sprinkling of death magic into Agatha, and Agatha's happy to have that little sprinkling of death. E3, D1, and you guessed it, random of earth and death. Two chances, 100% for the first, 10% for the latter. So, you can get D2. In fact, if you recruit two of these, you're likely to get a D2. D2 means you have D3, because Skull Staves are really basic piece of kit. So for practical purposes, Agatha has access to D3, and that's about where its death access stops. However, that's enough. This death is important because Agatha has national death summons that we will talk about, and the Oracle of the Dead, while expensive, is the most practical way with recruitable units to get access to them. Otherwise, you need Indies or a God or Boosting or something like that. The Oracle of the Dead is, in fact, the key to getting them otherwise. Finally, there is a Wet One Captain. Um, the Wet One Captain exists because you built an underwater fort and the local Indie commander is kind of shit um, or isn't recruitable because it's a mage and you don't have a lab and you desperately need to lead troops right now, so you're going to recruit a commander there. No other reason to recruit it. It's a 60 leadership, 35 gold, like basic ass Wet One commander. Like, for the most part, I'm just going to pass on that one. So, summary. we got Earth. we got lots of Earth. We got a little bit of death, we got a little bit of fire, we got a little bit of water. More water underwater, obviously, because of the way water works. And you can boost water using construction. So we realistically, um, we're limited by the fact that the Olm Sage doesn't have a body slots, but we realistically have access to water three above above land. And then we have a number of heroes. Well, before we talk about the heroes, which will require going to the mod inspector, we're going to talk about heroes and summons. Also worth noticing. There's a two Earth Bless bonus here. Agatha is a nation which gets, as long as they get enough Earth points to get any Bless points, they get two more. Worth noting, they're extremely well attuned to the Earth. I'm going to go into Mod Inspector now to talk about um, to talk about summons and heroes because they are important. Before I do so, a quick note on the capital site. Um, there is a scry ability in your capital. Just don't forget this. So you have the ability to send a mage in and one, once per turn, pick a province within six range and it counts as scouting scrying. So perfect scout information. Worth remembering. You have the gem sites, you have the seal guard site, and the most important one here is actually Roots of the Earth because that's what allows you to cast your national summon spells. With that said, I'm gonna go into Mod Inspector. I'm gonna show you two things, heroes, including the worthy heroes, and the National Summons, because they are critical to the way Agatha plays. Having looked at them, we're going to come back into the game. One second. Okay, we are in the modern spectrum. We're looking at Agatha's National Spells. I hinted at this when I was introducing the nation, but Agatha is a nation of summons, really. Your troops are... Well, they're pale ones. They have the advantages and disadvantages that come with that, but they're pretty mediocre unless they're supported, and one of the ways you can support them is using your array of National Summons and Spells. So let's have a look at each of them. The Death Summons are the first ones to look at. And these come in sort of three levels. There's the Conjuration 3 spells, and then there's a later Conjuration 5 spell. Notable, in all of these cases, you can cast them pretty much only with your Oracles of the Dead. And in the case of the later one, only Oracles of the Dead that either random D2 or are D1 but are holding a Skull Staff. Revive Cavern Whites is the shit spell. Um, so for 8 Death Gems, 8 Valuable Death Gems in a turn of a cap-only mage, you get 3 of these guys. These are 31 hit points, 16 prot, undead. Now they have high magic resistance, so they're hard to banish. And they have a Cold Aura, which is kind of good, but 3 Cold Aura undead? Like, do I really need more HP sacks? Do I really want to spend 8 Valuable Death Gems getting 3 Cavern Whites? 
The answer to my mind is almost always hell no. The second option is penumbrals. So penumbrals and umbrals are the spectres that um, stalk around the chamber that contains those imprisoned gods. But you can go down and summon a couple of them and bind them into your army in exchange for death gems using your oracles of the dead. So a penumbral is a 30 hit point size 3 undead unit with 14 magic resist and 18 morale. So solid in that chaos. Average skills, 10-10. So better than most pale ones. And has life drain. Life drain is a, so in the case of them, a 15 damage armor piercing magical weapon. So the advantage here is ethereal, obviously. The disadvantage is no protection and they cost one death gem each. You need to spend a cap only mage turn and gem but mostly a cap only mage turn to make one, one death unit. Could be worth it under each circumstances, but hard. These things take buff wells, buff swells. So if you get managed to get their prod up, they're you know decent units, but you're still spending individual uh, Oracle of the Dead turns summoning them. At Conjuration 5, you get the much better version. And the, the Umbral, the big guy, um, is strong enough and capable enough that he actually is going to stop people, make people stop and take notice. Here at 16 magic resistance and 18 morale, but you have 68 hit points. 68 on an ethereal strength 22 unit. And it still has that life drain. So now this is 22 armor piercing damage with a magic weapon. So this is a unit which when used in relatively small numbers, can kill some sorts of thugs and SCs. Ones that rely on protection in particular, um, protection or fear or devices like that, because as undead units, they're gonna ignore fear. With an armor piercing magic weapon, they're gonna bypass a lot of defense types. The life drain and their hit points is good to keep them alive as long as they can hit and at attack skill 12, assuming they surround the thugs, they're probably going to hit things. Now, in a line holding duty, it's harder to mass them, but if they take, they'll take protection buffs very, very well. You put these guys under, say, army of gold, <clears throat> so they're able to endure because they've got the protection from their etherealness and their protection, and they've got the HP coming in from their life drain on their already big HP points, and they become quite grindy against a lot of enemy unit types. So I rate umbrals. Umbrals have caused me umbrage. They have caused me difficulties. They have caused people I have seen difficulties. Are they superb and amazing? Uh, like no, because they've still only got these weak stats and you summon them one at a time using your capital only mages. But they're relatively cheap. I think this is worth two gems. I think this thing is worth two gems, um, especially when if used smartly, it can counter things that cost a lot more gems than that. So those are your D summons. Then there are your elemental summons. And of these, you have uh, one for each of your three oracle types. And it feeds into why I think some oracles are better than others. Also note, this first one I'm going to show you, um, in fact, most of these can be cast by things that aren't oracles. All right, firstly, Ruach's Pact. This is the best one. Well, rather, the one that people will cast most often, and yeah, probably the best one. It can only be cast in your capital because it requires the Roots of the Earth path. It does not require an Oracle. A Fire Random Earth Reader will do. And it costs two Fire Gems and comes at Conj 3, so it comes early. You're getting this when expansion, expansion is probably not even over, and you're getting this spell. You get five Magma Kids. This is a Magma Kid, a Magma Child. So what are we looking at? 17 hit points in size two. So like the pale ones, it's tougher than a human. It actually has a little bit of protection now and some magic res. It has the 50 morale, so it's not gonna rout. Resists fire, resists poison, has a heat aura and a fire shield and fire power. So instantly you're thinking, wow, this unit is gonna do interesting things if I put it in heat three. Because in heat three, that heat aura is gonna put people to sleep faster. And the firepower is going to give it three bonus on its defense, three bonus on its attack, and it's going to give it like it. 
it's going to elevate this unit, whereas in cold, it's going to suffer. So in heat, it has attack skill 13, defense skill um, 11, which is vaguely respectable for a size 2 unit that you have summoned for a fraction of a gem per. Not bad. Has spirit sight, and then here's the, um, the real draw for a lot of people. Intrinsic length to AoE 1 armor piercing fire magical damage weapon. What do you think of that? So, this is intrinsically going to be a 12 plus damage, although less if you get them into cold. But in heat, this will be a quite a high damage AoE 1 armor piercing weapon. Think about that for a moment. That's these are summonable firebrands. <laughs> these are, that's what they are. They're summonable higher damage firebrands. They're going to hit a square, so they're going to hit everyone in that square. They're going to do armor piercing damage, so they're going to cut straight through your prot in a lot of cases. And they're magic, so they don't care about a lot of defenses. So if the enemy is a glamoured elf, smack, the glamour is broken. If the enemy is a bunch of human formation fighters, well, you're going to get extra economy when you're smacking them, aren't you? If they're enemies with short weapons, well, that fire shield's going to go to work. Are they enemies that aren't uh, otherwise dangerous but aren't resistant to the heat aura? Well, then they're going to go to sleep and then they're going to get murdered, right? The magma child is just an answer to so many questions that pale ones can't normally deal with. Now, they're not perfect counters, right? So an elf with super high fire resistance or even a good amount of fire resistance isn't really going to care about... 12 or even 14 armor piercing fire damage if there's 10 fire resistance in there, right? Because that's going to take him down to 4 AP and then it's going to bounce off the armor. But for things that don't have fire resistance, the magma child is brutal. And as a result, for many Agarthans, they become the front line. This becomes a front line troop rather than pale ones, supported by mind blasters and umbrals, penumbrals, etc. Good unit in that sense. However, it's worth noting that by taking on Magma Children as your frontline option, you're essentially committing to fighting in heat. You go from not caring, whether it's like heat neutral, one, two, three, to really wanting your Dominion heat scales to be in there because it's going to give them the defense and the hard hittingness that's going to give you value for your fire gems. But reality is, most of the time, a lot of your fire gems are going to get turned into Magma Children and they're going to give you the troops that you need. Barthoros Pact is not as good. It costs two Earth Gems, and in exchange you get one size four Earth Elemental. I, I just think that's underwhelming. I think that's underwhelming. It covers one square rather than two and a bit. Uh, there's nothing special about this. I mean, you get a size six for one battle for one gem as opposed to a size 4 permanently for 2 gems and a mage turn. And the reality is most of the time the permanent... Any time the permanent uh, one would do work, it's probably going to die, which is exactly what a size 6 elemental would do anyway. So I wouldn't normally rate Barthoros Pact. I wouldn't normally do it. I haven't seen people do it. There's a case, a niche case maybe, um, but I don't see it for general use. So we're going to throw that away. Living Mercuries are niche weapons. Living Mercuries are, well, they're, they're complicated. So Tim, note that Tian Chi gets this weapon as well. Now this is not a cap only, and it can be summoned by your water, your water earth mages. So think Olms and subterranean waters. For seven water gems, you get a permanent size five Living Mercury. What is a Living Mercury? A Living Mercury is a poison cloud water elemental. It's basically what it is. It's a poison cloud water elemental. You still have the crush attacks. So these are 28 damage AP bludgeoning. So it's still a great unit of bashing through, thug protection. Um, you can even knock down monoliths and things like that with this as long as it's not ethereal. And even then you'll get some hits through and the monoliths can't regenerate. They're mindless, so they're not going to run away. And they have a poison cloud and are resistant to poison themselves. So Living Mercuries with a protection buff in particular, and notice I keep saying with a protection buff, but that's because you can throw protection buffs down. If you position them properly, so they don't poison your own troops, are a good way to either kill 
large, heavily armoured enemy units with their crush attacks, or they can wade into the enemy army and poison large amounts of it. they got reasonably good stats, and they're capable of doing so. Seven Water Gems is reasonably expensive for a permanent unit, considering you can get a non-poisonous size six Water Elemental for one battle for one gem. But having a Vanguard of Poison Units does force your enemy to plan, it does mean you don't have to bring water mages with water gems who can summon them to battle. I can see the case. Living Mercuries and Magma Children, as far as I'm concerned, get a pass. Um, Umbrals get an endorsement. I'm not keen on the Earth Elementals. So that's most of the summons. But you can see the Magma Children are the ones that are probably most meta-shaping, Although it's important to remember that you have access to the Umbrals and Living Mercuries. That said, worth remembering you need to go Enchantment to get Living Mercury, not Conjuration. And Conjuration is going to be your go-to to get your main ones, which are things like uh, Ruach's Pact and even the Umbral spells. Liquid Frame of Ruach's Mirror of Earth Memories and Unleashed Imprisoned Ones round out your national spells. Mirror of Earth Memories is cast from your cap site. It's ludicrously niche. Using an Oracle of Subterranean Water in your capital, you can essentially cast a weird voice of Tiamat on other caves that you own. Not provinces, caves. And it searches for earth, fire, water, and death. This is worth it if you find other caves and you don't want to send oracles there to search it, this is a very cost-effective search spell. It's got a range of 10. It's a, it's a good search spell. The problem is you're probably only going to have one, maybe two other caves as a Gartha. So most people forget this spell exists. Remember it exists. Use it when you take caves. But other than that, it can go away. It's not important. Liquid Frame Flames of Ruax is a slightly upgraded evocation. What have we got? Fire 3, Earth 1. Range 30, AoE 1, Fatigue 20, for 24 AE damage, and then it does Lingering damage. So, this is an okay point evocation that you get at Evo 5. It's better than Fireball. If I look, if I turn off National only for a moment, and I bring up Fireball, which is the obvious comparison, obviously earlier, you pay the higher path. Actually, probably fire, falling, falling fires is probably the better comparison. These two collectively, they serve different purposes. So, Liquid Flame of Ruax, when you compare to the other AoE 1 version, which is the Fireball, does more damage, and instead of causing heat, it has a lingering extra um, damage and then a and lingering heat effect. So, it's just more damaging and better. The extra effect is AP as well, handy. So harder to cast, but a better fireball. Compared to falling fires, you're losing the uh, AoE. So you're losing, you're going down from three AoE back to one. Okay, you need an earth path. Everything in freaking Agatha seems to have Earth, so that's not a problem. The trade-off is just, do you want to tickle things with 15 AP damage, or do you want to murder them with 24 AP damage, and the extra lingering effect? It's not devastating, it's not meta-shaping, it's not a reason to go for Evo 5 in and of itself, but it does mean some of your mages that can cast this might benefit from this a little bit at parts of the game. That's as far as I'd go with that. Unleash in Prison Ones is a meme. A flat out meme. You need to build your god for it because you need D4. D4 E6. Um, is it possible to get there using um, heroes and some boosting? Yeah, but um, anyway. You pay 100 earth gems. Oh, that's, that's harsh. Uh, you blow up your capital. Yeah, yeah, I said that right. You blow up, you blow up your capital. It's like what happens to Flegro with the volcano. Uh, so you lose a very significant chunk of your population. Your capital site changes out. You get a higher death gem income. So you get a few extra death gems per turn. You get a whole bunch of umbrals and penumbrals that were guarding the seal that now have nothing to bloody do with their unlives. So they come and join you instead because you blob the thing they were guarding and protecting. Damn. Anyway, so... You've done that, you get the Umbrals, Penumbrals, you kill a bunch of your capital population, 
and you unleash three titans on the world. Indie titans who wander around killing people. Just at random, just wandering around different provinces, causing shit to happen. And then when they are killed, they become this thing. True ethereal legions of gods. Because each Tartarian chassis is actually a prison for a whole bunch of gods. And these are super high path um, units that kill huge numbers of population. 1500 population, 1000 population. Increase unrest 20 per month in their Legion of God form. They still have Indie Move. They've got damage reversal in that form. They're going to go around. They're going to cause people pain and trouble. They're going to kill population. And the world is going to wonder why you spend 100 Earth Gems just making life terrible for everyone. But I don't know. Agathans make terrible decisions. It's kind of one of the national pastimes. Kind of like Abyssia in that sense. So if you get to Alt-9, which you'll probably do as Abyssia because you want to be able to Army of Gold, Army of Lead, you can choose to unleash the Imprisoned Ones. Do you want to? I wouldn't, but if it was a meme game, maybe there's an argument for it. Or it's maybe just something you threaten the world with. I can think of better uses for 100 Earth Gems personally. Let's move on to the last bit of this because this is getting long. Heroes. Let's go heroes. And I don't have worthy heroes on, by the way. We'll check if it adds anyone to Agatha. But as Agatha, what you get are the members of the Closed Council, who are essentially the rulers of Agatha, including the oldest of them, Ogon. So here you are. These are those. And then I'll also show you, you get a multi-hero, the Ulm Spawn, who we'll talk about, and the Ancient Ulm Deep Thought. These heroes are pretty good in terms of access. What do they give you? Well, so Ogon's the first. Um, Ogon gives you E5 native, which means you can go to E6 with boosts. He's just, a, he's just a better Earth user than everyone else in your nation. Also comes with Fire 2. Guaranteed, well, if you, if you get him, he's guaranteed to get it. And like all of his colleagues, um, like all of his colleagues, he's basically a clone of your um, Oracle chassis, but better. Like he's a fortune teller. He's a better fortune teller than some of the others, for example. Not Holy Four, unfortunately, but a little bit of extra E access, never went astray, means he can do some more global casting and your god is released from that duty, especially if your god only has like three or four Earth. Moss Agate is the one I'm probably most or second most excited when she turns up because Moss Agate is your diversity pick in the sense that she has water and she's got nature. And that should instantly scream to you, one, hooray, I have nature access. Two, hooray, I can make naiads. And if I can make naiads, I am a nature nation now and a water nation, and if I later get onto top level conjuration, I'm an air nation because I can get fairy queens. Moss Agate is the single like key, other than finding appropriately cross-pathed indies, to guaranteeing a break-in. I say guaranteeing, you can never guarantee a hero is going to arrive. Guaranteeing your access to water and air magic, which broadens your diversity considerably. Plus the fact that Moss Agate is one of the less morally ambiguous members of the Closed Council means she gets my vote. Lapis. Lapis is not a very good member of the Closed Council, but she's there. You've got the Stygian path, which is which is interesting. You've got the water death cross path, which is, I suppose, a little bit cool. There's niche purposes for it. Now, what you can do with Lapis, I'm pretty sure... Yes, you can. Okay, so here's Lapis, and here's the spell Stygian Reigns. You can cast Stygian Reigns with Lapis. That gives everything on the field in vulnerability 15. Now, the fact that you're using Magma Kids, who, ha who do AP magic damage, who don't care about invulnerability, and the fact your Seal Guards don't care about invulnerability, and your Umbrals and Penumbrals don't care about invulnerability, mean maybe if you have Lapis, what you're going to go do is go cast Stygian Reign in battles. Maybe that's what you're going to do. That, that's, what, that's, that's what I would do. Other than that, not super amazing as far as I'm concerned. Obsidian Eye is D3. 
D3 means D4 when you account for the staff. You're one in power off D5 at that point. D5 means D6. At that point, you are you are big death. You are big death. You are summoning liches and wraith lords. In your case, probably wraith lords because you probably went conjuration rather than anything else. Um, at that point, you've done it. So it had taken him power, or it would take someone giving you another booster, but this is the closest you will get, unless you build your god for it, to breaking your way into the rest of death. And Obsidian Eye is also a strong advocate against breaking the seal, so he gets my vote for not nuking ourselves 2020. Respons responsible voice in politics. The fact that evidently someone probably doesn't listen to him, depending on how you interpret the law, uh, means that clearly reason has gone out of a garth in politics in this era, at least at some point. Then you got the Olm heroes. So, one unique hero, Deep Thought, is your highest water caster. So, W2, but you can only have one of the boosters. You can't have the body slots, so you can only go to W4. You can also go to W4 on Lapis by getting two water boosters. And you can go to Water 5 through Moss Agate by making Nyad. So, Deep Thought, not, not special, but not handy to have Water 3, uh, three for free if it turns up. There's no turn limit on arrival, so you can get it early. 70 magic leadership, like you're not going to say no, but it's not a world-changing hero. It's not a diversity hero, unlike, say, Moss Agate. The Ember Stream multi-hero, like most multi-heroes, doesn't change your game dramatically. Has a small chance of having a death random, which is handy. It's basically just a... It's, a, it's an early shard guard. It's an early shard guard commander, shard mage, rather, from the Middle Age, in the Early Age. You'll get a couple... There you go. So, what are you holding out for? Well, the heroes complicate things a little bit for me, because on one hand, Agatha can endure misfortune scales better than other nations, because you've got Fortune Teller, which means that your forts, at least, are probably going to be protected from the worst events, so you might be tempted to take misfortune. However, if you take too much misfortune, your heroes will never arrive, and if you take good fortune, your heroes will arrive sooner. And in the case of Agatha, You've got a hero which breaks you into a new set of paths. So if you didn't go this way on your god, for example, I might consider preserving a little more luck than I otherwise would because I want Naiad's nature and fairy queens and air and I want to break into all those paths. Or I want to break into death summons and I didn't do that on my god, so I need Obsidian Eye because I'm going to boost him up and I'm going to break into high-level death casters. Fine. It's a reasonable hero lineup. It's not the greatest hero lineup in the game. There's a couple that impact your choices. There's a couple that don't. So, there we are. Those are the heroes. I'm going to click back into the game now, if that's all right. Okay, so what are you actually doing as Agatha? We've gone through the troops. We've gone through the summons. We've gone through the spells. What are you actually doing um, and Agatha? So let's talk about early mid-game. Let's talk about your late game plan. And then we'll close out by talking about god design, because really, I think Agatha can go a couple of ways. In the early game, the very early game, your expansion strategy is one of two things, or maybe a mixture. You've either decided to try and make the sacred, the big dumb sacreds work. You've been like, I've got recruit anywhere sacreds, so and their stats suck, but I don't care. But I'm going to make them work. So if you've slapped, if you've gone. And you've said, look, I'm going to slap plus four attack skill, plus four defense skill, regeneration, whatever, on the seal guard. Then congratulations, you can expand with them. They hit really hard, and if you give them some stats, they can actually kill things. And they have enough hit points that they'll probably survive. So that's one strategy you can go with. The other strategy is the one we discussed earlier, where you're putting a, a small, a moderate number of alms behind Pale One troops, the alms are going to mind blast things, and the Pale Ones are going to either stab the paralyzed people who can't dodge, or they're going to exploit the fact that the enemy comes to them in drips and drabs, because half the enemy is paralyzed and twitching in the back line, to have a bunch of 5-on-1, 6-on-1, 9-on-1, where they can harass their enemy down, and then stab them, because they're all trying to stab them at once. So, Either way, you build your expansion force to compensate for the inadequate skills of your infantry. Those are your two very early game options. Then you're going to start summoning. You're going to start summoning probably magma children, and you're going to mix them into your units 
to counter some of the forces that you might uh, deal with. And then you're going to decide on a mid game and a late game plan. Agatha has a bunch of middle and late game tools at their disposal. They have their summons. Their summons respond very well to buffs. So you can go up uh, alteration or the other buff paths and you can start doing things like point buffing uh, your ethereal units. So point buffing umbrals, penumbrals with iron warriors, for example, gives you super 20 protection dangerous units. You can put a, um, if you get access to nature, mass protection handles, it goes on your units very, very well. Um, and then the other opportunity to buff in inverted commas your units is instead to nerf the shit out of enemy units. So if you go to darkness and go up big death, darkness is an instant six point swing. And there's, there's some interesting maths to be heard here. Um, warning, there's about to be numbers involved here. Okay, because I, I sometimes think people don't appreciate just how important attack and defense stats are. Let's say there's zero fatigue involved. Your pale ones have what? Nine, let's let's go with the nine attack version. If you have nine attack, the defender's got say 12. That's about a 25% chance to hit, right? Um, not great. You reduce that defender down to six defense because you still, because it's under darkness, you still have nine attack, but now they've got six defense because they've gone minus six. Your hit rate's gone from 25% to 70% you have almost tripled your damage output. At the same time, Mr. I'm hitting you back with 12 attack, so Mr. Average Human, who's hitting your nine defense with his 12 attack, was hitting you 70% 70, 70 of the time. Now he's hitting you like 24% of the time, right? So, because the, the, mat what matters here is the numerical difference. So you've reduced the damage coming in by about three times, you've tripled the damage going out. Suddenly, pale ones are dangerous, bloody things in darkness, and they're dangerous in their caves too. So, having darkness on your side or things that can take the sun away really aid the Agarthan army. The other thing to note is Agarthans are all big and chunky, including their mages. They've got their hit points, they can survive, they've got earth magic in the case of their mages, so they can iron skin as an opening. What this means is Agartha's very good at surviving battlefield, wipe, uh, battlefield wipes. And Agartha's capital is always going to be in a bloody cave. And caves, you can see where I'm going with this. Earthquake is a good example. In a cave, Earthquake does 20 damage instead of the usual 8 which is devastating. And Agatha has ready ability to cast it, but at the same time, your average pale one unit is going to survive a 20 damage earthquake. Uh, a seal guard will shrug off a 20 damage earthquake. They've got prot, they'll get hit by it because their defense sucks, but they've got 44 hit points. They'll be right. You know, she'll, be, she'll be right in the morning, maybe some afflictions, who knows? But. You can single or double cast uh, Earthquake, you can put up Battlefield Wipes and things like Firestorm, thinking you'll last longer than the other guy, and you probably will. Because the big dumb sacks of HP have the big dumb sacks of HP, which allows them to endure that sort of fighting. So that's sort of like your combat strategy. You can use Battlefield-wide buffs to make your units better, you can use uh, Battlefield-wide nerfs to make your opponents worse. Darkness is the best example I can think of there. Or you can exploit the fact that your guys are tough to ling in into the battlefield wipe strategies, which will hurt your enemies if they're human-sized a lot more than they hurt you. This leads into strategic thinking from Agatha. Agatha is a slow-moving nation that loves its own dominion. Agatha will be Heat 3. And the Heat 3 will protect its mages from cold-blooded. It will make its magma children the best that they can possibly be. And on the flip side, moving into Cold Dominion makes Agatha sad. What this means is Agatha needs to be very considered with its wars. It takes ground, fortifies, resets, brings its dominion up, and then it attacks again once it's reset and marched into position. And once it's committed to an attack, it's committed, because those troops aren't getting anywhere else very fast. It also means that if you're in a game with Agatha, and you are a cold nation, that you are at a great advantage 
in some senses. It means that on the defensive, you know that they can't push you that much. Their troops are going to tire out incredibly quickly, and their majors are going to tire out very quickly. Lean into that. Wolven winter provinces and then deploy Grip of Winter. The Agarthan army will fall asleep. On the Agarthan side, make sure you're working in heat terrain in so far as possible, and choose opponents well. Fighting Abyssia is fine, other than the fact your magma children are going to be useless. Um, Fighting people who've chosen heat who aren't Abyssia, so heat but not fire resistant, is even better. At the start of the game, neutral temperature is fine. You won't have many magma kids. Later on, you want a little bit of safety. So somewhere on the heat scale is, is preferable. But Agatha is very good at playing the siege game. So when you attack people, Agatha is not really a raidy nation. You're not going to be doing much raiding. You can send out small groups and control territory, we're not going to elf people. What you're going to do is go for people's forts, crack them, take them, and hold them. Because you've got the siege strength and the do not eat on your side. Very few people crack forts as cheaply, as effectively as you do. And when it comes time for those grinding fort assaults, you've got the buffs, you've got the mind blasters, you've got the tools to get it done. Maybe not quite as good as birds who can just fly over the wall, but you can get it done. What else can I say about Agatha strategically? The water is an interesting question for Agatha. Um, almost all the water nations in EA are in a position to actually put up a really good fight against Agatha in the water, and Agatha's probably not as strong underwater as Atlantis, definitely not as strong as Relay. Um, Pelagia, Oceania, all of these nations have big water majors that are a challenge to you. That said, your basic strategy works underwater, minus the magma kids. Olm's mind blasting for pale ones works underwater just as well as it works on land, and your mind blasters don't cost any more than relays. In fact, yours is sacred, which is always really handy. Um, if we look at the relay mind blasters, gibboleths are 40 gold. Oh, sorry. It's the gibberdai, which are the same cost and sacred. But the andradai, not andradai, andraleths on land cost 50 gold. So this is the equivalent to an Ulm, right? Because I can go on land. It's not sacred. And it's got fewer hit points. It's it's not this is not as good. So you know, there's there's grounds there. Your water two mages can water power to water three and make water elementals. Don't rule out fighting underwater, is what I'm saying. Don't get lured into thinking you need wet ones. You don't. You need ordinary pale ones and alms. And maybe an amphibious protector and a couple of water gems. You're not going to have the water gym income or the makeup to fight one-on-one -on -one against an equal enemy, but if someone's in a fight underwater, you can get involved. If someone's weaker than you because you've expanded well, you can get involved. The privilege, the privilege of being able to contest underwater nations and not just have them annoy you is fantastic. Because you are one of the nations the water nations can't go, oh, give me shit or I'll raid your coast, bro. You can tell them, well, I'll come take your capital because I can swim, bro. And they'll go annoy someone else. So that is a diplomatic advantage that Agatha has, the way they can interact with the water. And if there's no water nations, lakes belong to Agatha. And if there's a Therados in the game, well, Agatha can kind of fight Therados pretty well. So... Building on all that, what happens in the late game? Late game, you get super high level buffs. You're, you have huge earth, and that screams Alt-9. We're dropping Army of Gold, Army of Lead. We are using a little bit of construction magic. We are going Army of Gold, Firestorm. We are going Army of Lead and all kinds of battlefield wipes. Um, and all of a sudden, our Magma Kids and Umbrals and Penumbrals and the things that we were using as our front lines are now super survivable. The Especially those Death Summons are now... Hard-hitting magic AP damage in a high-prot ethereal package. Love it. <clears throat> love it, love it, love it. And at that point, you can move from using uh, Earth Readers to do point buffing or area buffing and move to Oracles casting Battlefield Whites. That's, that's your endgame. That, Darkness, big spells like that. Conjuration to break you into other areas. You're good to go. The area I've left last, I'm deliberately going to talk about least, is God Design, because Agatha has different philosophies that can power it. 
if you are going to be an Agatha that is all about the mind blasting and the summons, Scales Agatha works. Some luck to get your heroes, some production, all that sort of stuff. A, a few scales, definitely heat three, so you're going to pick up some points. Magic is good because you've got a super efficient researcher. Like Agatha can get some use, can get some use out of scales. The problem is there will always be a temptation to say, well, I don't expand as well as some people. Maybe I want to wake. So the Agatha in this game went with an Earth Snake. Perfectly viable expander. Um, really basic. And you want to pretend it with at least some Earth. If you do go Mega Scales, what you can do is you can either have a weak god that will help you expand, but isn't great. Or you can go Imprisoned and get a hell of a Mage Bless. Mage Bless or Stat Bless. The two choices here are, one, you can get a whole bunch of points for your mages. So, like, Reinvig 4 is on the cards. Um, or Reinvig, some resistances, pick up some other paths. Or you can get some stat blesses out for your sacreds. You can try and salvage these cap these not cap only, these recruit everywhere sacreds for your purposes. Uh, attack skill, defense skill, resistances, regen, they're like giants. They benefit from all of it, but they start from a worse like starting base, so they need more. They need more of everything. They need attack, defense, survivability. They need a little bit of it all, but if you go that way, it's an option. The other possibility is you say, I want an awake, and I'm going to use my bonus earth points, and I'm going to get like a big earth incarnate bless. It's, a, it's an option. Um, there are some there are some big Earth Blessers out there that you can take advantage of. My style doesn't favor that sort of play, but you shouldn't forget those two Bless points. So I'm not going to be pretty prescriptive here. Um, Agatha can try and salvage its Sacreds. Agatha can give its Mages big Blessers. Agatha can take an Awake Expander. Or Agatha can do it without an Expander. In my tests, at least, it seems to work. It's a little slower than some nations, but it works. Um, do you need a god that can dissuade early aggression? I, I don't think you do particularly. I think you've got... I think the Mind Blast troop combo is enough to play with early if you're a little bit brave and Conjuration 3 comes quickly enough that you'll get your summons early enough. But that's just my view. There are different schools of thought in Agatha, and I haven't tested them. All I know is I have played against a very heavily blessed Agatha, and it works. It 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 works. Um, Seal Guard with a very heavy bless on them are freaking scare are actually really scary. But Agatha can work without that too. So play Agatha the way you want to play it. If you're interested in seeing a Bless Agatha uh, go to town, my Pelagia game will be putting out more episodes soon where I'll demonstrate that. I've rambled a bit, so let's provide a summary. Agatha is a, a good middling power. They're held back by limited strategic mobility, so the one province movement thing. They're held back by the relatively low stats of most of their units, so the fact they are reliant on mind blasting or buffs or darkness, or things like that, <clears throat> definitely holds them back. Um, they're held back a little bit by magical diversity, and they're held back by the cold-blooded nature. They're really dependent on heat scales. They're supported by phenomenal siege strength, the gold efficiency of a lot of their troops, and hard-hitting nature, the availability of mind blasters, a good summon lineup, and a very efficient researcher, as well as some decent heroes and capital-only mages. That's enough to make them a solid, playable nation that can win games. They are not the best. They're probably not the best incarnation of the nation either. They don't have the statues, for example, of Middle Age, and they don't have the human troop options that come later. But the Pale Ones have some hope, and maybe in your hands their war against the surface world will not end up being a complete and utter failure. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I wish you the best of luck playing EA Agatha or playing against EA Agatha. And I welcome any contributions in the comments. Cheers.